Book Two, The Church of Good Society, Part One, of The Prophets of Religion by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Within the house of Mammon, his priesthood stands alert, by mysteries attended, by dusk and splendors girt, knowing for faiths departed his own shall still endure and they be found his chosen untroubled solemn sure within the house of mammon the golden altar lifts where dragon lamps are shrouded as costly incense drifts a dust of old ideals now fragrant from the coals to tell of hopes long ended to tell the death of souls. Sterling. The Rainmakers. I begin with the Church of Good Society, because it happens to be the church in which I was brought up. Reading this statement, some of my readers suspected me of snobbish pride. I search my heart. Yes. It brings a hidden thrill that as far back as I can remember I knew this atmosphere of urbanity, that twice every Sunday those melodious and hypnotizing incantations were chanted in my childish ears. I take up the book of ritual, done in aristocratic black leather with gold lettering, and the old worn volume brings me strange stirrings of recollected awe but I endeavor to repress these vestigial emotions, and to see the volume not as a message from God to good society, but as a landmark of man's age-long struggle against myth and dogma used as a source of income and a shield to privilege. In the beginning, of course, the priest and the magician ruled the field. But today, as I examine this Book of Common Prayer, I discover that there is at least one spot out of which he has been cleared entirely. There appears no prayer to planets to stand still, or to comets to go away. The Church of Good Society has discovered astronomy. But if any astronomer attributes this to his instruments with their marvelous accuracy, let him at least stop to consider my economic interpretation of the phenomenon. The fact that the heavenly bodies affect the destinies of mankind so little that there has not been sufficient emolument to justify the priest in holding on to his job as astrologer. But when you come to the field of meteorology, what a difference! Has any utmost precision of barometer been able to drive the priest out of his prerogatives as rainmaker? Not even in the most civilized of countries, not in that most decorous and dignified of institutions, the Protestant Episcopal Church of America. I study with care the passage wherein the clergyman appears as controller of the fate of crops. I note a chastened caution of phraseology. The church will not repeat the experience of the sorcerer's apprentice, who set the demons to bringing water, and then could not make them stop. The spell invokes moderate rain and showers. And, as an additional precaution, there is a counter-spell against excessive rains and floods the weather faucet being thus under exact control. I turn the pages of this Book of Common Prayer, and note the remnants of magic which it contains. There are not many of the emergencies of life with which the priest is not authorized to deal, not many natural phenomena for which he may not claim the credit. And in case anything should have been overlooked, there is a blanket order upon providence. Graciously hear us, that those evils which the craft or subtlety of the devil or man worketh against us, be brought to naught. I am reminded of the idea which haunted my childhood, 
reading fairy stories about the hero who was allowed three wishes that would come true. I could never understand why the hero did not settle the matter once for all, by wishing that everything he wished might come true. Most of these incantations are harmless, and some are amiable. But now and then you come upon one which is sinister in its implications. The volume before me happens to be of the Church of England, which is even more forthright in its confronting of the great magic. Many years ago I remember talking with an English army officer, asking how he could feel sure of his soldiers in case of labor strikes. Did it never occur to him that the men had relatives among the workers, and might sometime refuse to shoot them? His answer was that he was aware of it. The military had worked out its technique with care. He would never think of ordering his men to fire upon a mob in cold blood. He would first start the spell of discipline to work. He would march them round the block and get them in the swing, get their blood moving to military music. Then, when he gave the order, in they would go. I have never forgotten the gesture, the animation with which he illustrated their going. I could hear the grunting of bayonets in the flesh of men. The social system prevailing in England has made necessary the perfecting of such military technique. Also, you discover, English piety has made necessary the providing of a religious sanction for it. After the job has been done, and the bayonets have been wiped clean, the company is marched to church, and the officer kneels in his family pew, and the privates kneel with the parlor maids, and the clergyman raises his hands to heaven and intones, We bless thy holy name, that it hath pleased thee to appease the seditious tumults which have been lately raised up among us. And sometimes the clergyman does more than bless the killers. He even takes part in their bloody work. In the Home Office Records of the British Government, I read, Volume 40, page 17, how certain miners were on strike against low wages and the truck system, and the vicar of Abergavenny put himself at the head of the yeomanry and the greys. He wrote the Home Office a lively account of his military operations. All that remained was to apprehend certain of the strikers, and then I shall be able to return to my clerical duties. Later he wrote of the sinister influences which kept the miners from returning to their work, and how he had put half a dozen of the most obstinate in prison. THE BABYLONIAN FIRE GOD So we come to the most important of the functions of the tribal god, as an ally in war, an inspirer to martial valor. When in ancient Babylonia you wished to overcome your enemies, you went to the shrine of the fire god, and with awful rites the priest pronounced incantations, which have been preserved on bricks and handed down for the use of modern churches. Pronounce in a whisper, and have a bronze image therewith, commands the ancient text, and runs on for many strophes in this fashion. Let them die, but let me live. Let them be put under a ban, but let me prosper. Let them perish, but let me increase. Let them become weak, but let me wax strong. O fire god, mighty, exalted among the gods, thou art the god, thou art my lord, etc. This was in heathen Babylon some three thousand years ago. Since then the world has moved on. Three thousand years of war and peace and glory, of hope and work and deeds and golden schemes, of mighty voices raised in song and story, 
of huge inventions and of splendid dreams. And in one of the world's leading nations the people stand up and bare their heads and sing to their god to save their king and punish those who oppose him. O Lord our God, arise, scatter his enemies, and make them fall. Confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. On him our hopes we fix, God save us all. Recently, I understand, it has become the custom to omit this stanza from the English national anthem. But it is clear that this is because of its crudity of expression, not because of objection to the idea of praying to a god to assist one nation and injure others. For the same sentiment is expressed again and again in the most carefully edited of prayer books. Abate their pride, assuage their malice, and confound their devices. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies. Strengthen him, the king, that he may vanquish and overcome all his enemies. There is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. Prayers such as these are pronounced in every so-called civilized nation today. Behind every battle line in Europe you may see the priests of the Babylonian fire god, with their bronze images and their ancient incantations. You may see magic spells being wrought, magic standards sanctified, magic bread eaten, and magic wine drunk, fetishes blessed and hoodoos lifted, eternity ransacked to find means of inciting soldiers to the mood where they will go in. Throughout all civilization, the phobias and manias of war have thrown the people back into the toils of the priest, and that church which forced Galileo to recant under threat of torture, and had Ferrer shot beneath the walls of the fortress of Montjuich, is rejoicing in a rebirth of religion. THE MEDICINE MEN Andrew D. White tells us that it was noted that in the fourteenth century, after the Great Plague, the Black Death, had passed, an immensely increased proportion of the landed and personal property of every European country was in the hands of the Church. Well did a great ecclesiastic remark that pestilences are the harvests of the ministers of God. And so naturally the clergy hold on to their prerogative as banishers of epidemics. Who knows what day the Lord may see fit to rebuke the upstart teachers of impious and atheistical inoculation, and scourge the people back into his fold, as in the good old days of Moses and Aaron? Viscount Amberley, in his immensely learned and half-suppressed work, the analysis of religious belief, quotes some missionaries to the Fiji Islanders concerning the ideas of these benighted heathen on the subject of a pestilence. It was the work of a disease-maker who was burning images of the people with incantations, so they blew horns to frighten this disease-maker from his spells. The missionaries undertook to explain the true cause of the affliction, and thereby reveal that they stood upon the same intellectual level as the heathen they were supposed to instruct. It appeared that the natives had been at war with their neighbors, and the missionaries had commanded them to desist. They had refused to obey, and God had sent the epidemic as punishment for savage presumption. And on precisely this same Fijian level stands the Book of Common Prayer, of our most decorous and cultured of churches. I remember as a little child lying on a bed of sickness, occasioned by the prevalence in our home of the southern custom of hot bread three times a day, 
and there came an amiable clerical gentleman and recited the service proper to such pastoral calls. "'Take therefore in good part the visitation of the Lord.' And again, when my mother was ill, I remember how the clergyman read out in church a prayer for her, specifying all sickness, in mind, body, or estate. I was thinking only of my mother, and the meaning of these words passed over my childish head. I did not realize that the elderly plutocrat in black broadcloth, who knelt in the pew in front of me, was invoking the aid of the Almighty, so that his tenements might bring in their rentals promptly, so that his little flyer in cotton might prove successful, so that the children in his mills might work with greater speed. Somebody asked Voltaire if you could kill a cow by incantations, and he answered, Yes, if you use a little strychnine with it and that would seem to be the attitude of the present-day Anglican church member. He calls in the best physician he knows, he makes sure that his plumbing is sound, and after that he thinks it can do no harm to let the Lord have a chance. It makes the women happy, and after all, there are a lot of things we don't yet know about the world. So he repairs to the family pew, and recites over the venerable prayers, and contributes his might to the maintenance of an institution which, fourteen Sundays every year, proclaims the terrifying menaces of the Athanasian creed. Whoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith, except one do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. For the benefit of the uninitiated reader, it may be explained that the Catholic faith here referred to is not the Roman Catholic, but that of the Church of England and the Protestant Episcopal Church of America. This creed of the ancient Alexandrian lays down the truth with grim and menacing precision. Forty-four paragraphs of metaphysical minutia closing with the final doom this is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. You see, the founders of this august institution were not content with cultured complacency. What they believed they believed really, with their whole hearts, and they were ready to act upon it, even if it meant burning their own at the stake. Also, they knew the ceaseless impulse of the mind to grow, the terrible temptation which confronts each new generation to believe that which is reasonable. They met the situation by setting out the true faith in words which no one could mistake. They have provided not merely the creed of Athanasius, but also the Thirty-Nine Articles, which are thirty-nine separate and binding guarantees that one who holds orders in the Episcopal Church shall be either a man of inferior mentality or else a sophist and hypocrite. How desperate some of them have become in the face of this cruel dilemma is illustrated by the tale which is told of Dr. Jowett of Balliol College, Oxford that when he was required to recite the Apostles' Creed in public, he would save himself by inserting the words, used to, between the words, I believe, saying the inserted words under his breath, thus, I, used to, believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Perhaps the eminent divine never did this, but the fact that his students told it, and thought it funny, is sufficient indication of their attitude toward their religion. The son of William George Ward tells in his biography how this leader of the Tractarian movement met the problem with cynicism which seems almost sublime. Make yourself clear that you are justified in deception, and then lie like a trooper.
THE CANONIZATION OF INCOMPETENCE The supreme crime of the Church today is that everywhere, and in all its operations and influences, it is on the side of sloth of mind, that it banishes brains, it sanctifies stupidity, it canonizes incompetence. Consider the power of the Church of England and its favorite daughter here in America. Consider their prestige with the press and in politics their hold upon literature and the arts, their control of education and the minds of children, of charity and the lives of the poor. Consider all this, and then say what it means to society that such a power must be, in every new issue that arises, on the side of reaction and falsehood. So it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, runs the church's formula, and this per se and a priori, of necessity and in the nature of the case. Turn over the pages of history and read the damning record of the church's opposition to every advance in every field of science, even the most remote from theological concern. Here is the Reverend Edward Massey, preaching in 1772 on the dangerous and sinful practice of inoculation, declaring that Job's distemper was probably confluent smallpox, that he had been inoculated doubtless by the devil, that diseases are sent by providence for the punishment of sin, and that the proposed attempt to prevent them is a diabolical operation. Here are the Scotch clergy of the middle of the nineteenth century denouncing the use of chloroform in obstetrics, because it is seeking to avoid one part of the primeval curse on woman. Here is Bishop Wilberforce of Oxford anathematizing Darwin. The principle of natural selection is absolutely incompatible with the word of God. It contradicts the revealed relation of creation to its creator. It is inconsistent with the fullness of his glory. It is a dishonoring view of nature. And the bishop settled the matter by asking Huxley whether he was descended from an ape through his grandmother or grandfather. Think what it means, friends of progress, that these ecclesiastical figures should be set up for the reverence of the populace, and that every time mankind is to make an advance in power over nature, the pioneers of thought have to come with crowbars and derricks and heave these figures out of the way. And you think that conditions are changed today? But consider syphilis and gonorrhea, about which we know so much and can do almost nothing. Consider birth control, which we are sent to jail for so much as mentioning. Consider the divorce reforms for which the world is crying, and for which it must wait, because of St. Paul. Realize that up to date it has proven impossible to persuade the English church to permit a man to marry his deceased wife's sister that when the war broke upon England the whole nation was occupied with a squabble over the disestablishment of the Church of Wales. Only since 1888 has it been legally possible for an unbeliever to hold a seat in Parliament, while up to the present day men are tried for blasphemy and convicted under the decisions of Lord Hale, to the effect that, it is a crime either to deny the truth of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian religion, or to hold them up to contempt or ridicule. Said Mr. Justice Horridge at the West Riding Assizes, 1911, A man is not free in any public place to use common ridicule on subjects which are sacred. The purpose, as outlined by the public prosecutor in London, is 
to preserve the standard of outward decency. And you will find that the one essential to prosecution is always that the victim shall be obscure and helpless. Never by any chance is he a duke in a drawing-room. I will record an utterance of one of the obscure victims of the British standard of outward decency, a teacher of mathematics named Holyoke, who presumed to discuss in a public hall the starvation of the working classes of the country. A preacher objected that he had discussed our duty to our neighbor, and neglected our duty to God whereupon the lecturer replied, Our national church and general religious institutions cost us, upon accredited computation, about twenty million pounds annually. Worship being thus expensive, I appeal to your heads and your pockets whether we are not too poor to have a god. While our distress lasts, I think it would be wise to put deity upon half pay." and for that utterance the unfortunate teacher of mathematics served six months in the common jail at Gloucester. While men were being tried for publishing the Free Thinker, the premier of England was William Ewart Gladstone, and if you wish to know what an established church can do by way of setting up dullness in high places, get a volume of this grand old man's writings on theological and religious questions. Read his Juventus Mundi, in the course of which he establishes a mystic connection between the trident of Neptune and the Christian Trinity. Read his efforts to prove that the writer of Genesis was an inspired geologist. This writer of Genesis points out in nature a grand fourfold division set forth in an orderly succession of times. First, the water population, secondly, the air population, thirdly, the land population of animals, fourthly, the land population consummated in man. And it seems that this division and sequence is understood to have been so affirmed in our time by natural science that it may be taken as a demonstrated conclusion and established fact. Hence we must conclude of the writer of Genesis that his knowledge was divine. Consider that this was actually published in one of the leading British monthlies, and that it was necessary for Professor Huxley to answer it, pointing out that so far is it from being true that a fourfold division and orderly sequence of water, air, and land animals has been affirmed in our time by natural science, that on the contrary the assertion is directly contradictory to facts known to every one who is acquainted with the elements of natural science. The distribution of fossils proves that land animals originated before sea animals and there has been such a mixing of land, sea, and air animals as utterly to destroy the reputation of both Genesis and Gladstone as possessing a divine knowledge of geology. End of Book Two, Part One